Dumb Witch Horror by H. P. Lovecraft. Chapter 10. In the end, the three men from Arkham, old, white-bearded Dr. Armitage, stocky, iron-grey Professor Rice, and lean, youngish Dr. Morgan, ascended the mountain alone, after much patient instruction regarding its focusing and use. They left the telescope with a frightened group that remained in the road. As they climbed, they were watched closely by those of whom the glass was passed around. It's hard going, and Armitage had to be helped more than once. High above the tolling group, the great swathe trembled. His hellish maker repassed with snail-like deliberateness. Then it was as a, then it was obvious that the pursuers were gaining. Curtis Watley of the undecayed branch was holding the telescope for the Arkham party detoured ra- radically from this wave. He told the crowd of men who were openly trying to get the sub peak, which overlooked looked this wave at a point consistently ahead where the shrubbery was now bending. This indeed proved to be true. Part of it seemed to gain a minor revelation. Only a short time of visible blasphemy had passed it, when Wesley Corey, who had, been, who had just taken the grass, cried out that Armitage was addressing the prayer which Rice held, that something must be about to happen. The crowd stirred uneasily, recalling this prayer with respect to give the unseen horror a moment of visibility. Two or three men shut their eyes, but Curtis was orderly, snapped back the telescope and strained his vision to the utmost. He saw that Rice from the party point of vantage, above and behind the enemy, and an excellent chance of spreading a potent power the, with marvellous effect. The news of that telescope saw only an instant's flash, a grey cloud, a cloud about the size of Montfrey's side, large building. Near the top of the mountain, Curtis had held the instrument, dropped it, a piercing shriek in the ankle beaten mud of the road he reeled, and would have crumbled to the ground, and not two or three others seized and said it in. All he could do was moan half ugly. Oh my, oh my God, God, what that, that. There was no, there was a pandemonium of questioning. Only Henry Wheeler thought to risk it a fallen telescope and wipe it clean of mud. Curtis was about to pass all coronation. The even isolated replies were almost too much for him. Bigger and better, all made of squirming ropes. Oh, so our shape like a hen. Big, bigger, anything with dozens of legs and hog eggs that half shut up when they sla- step. Nothing solid about it. All but all but like jelly, and made and stubborn like wiggling ropes, pushed close together. Great bulging eyes all over it. Ten or twenty mouths, the trunks are stitching, but all along the sides, big as stove pipes, and all the tossing and opening and shuttering, all grey with a kind of blue or purple rings, all golden heaven, or a face on the top. His final memory ever, it was, proved too much for poor Curtis. He collapsed completely before he could say no more. Could say more. Fred Farr and Will Hutchins carried him to the roadside and laid him in the damp grass. Henry Miller, Trembling down, which turned to the rescue telescope on the mountain to see what he might. Through the lenses was discernible three tiny figures apparently running toward the summit as fast as the steep inclined the land. Only these, nothing more. Then everyone noticed a strangely unseizable noise in the deep valley behind. Even the underbrush was sent on hill itself. It was a piping of numbered whirling wheels and a shrill chorus. It seemed a look of night with tense and evil expectancy. I also now took the telescope and pulled the three figures and standing on the topmost reach, virtually level with an altar stone, but at no considerable distance from it. One figure, he said, seemed to be rising its hands above its head at rhythmic intervals. As Sayo mentioned, circumstances, the crowd seemed to fail. He had a faint half musical sound of distance. As if a low touch was accompanying the gestures, a weird silhouette on that remote peak must have been a spectacle of infinite growth and crispness and impressiveness, and there was other was a good a mood for ascetic apprehension. Well, I guess he was saying spell, 
this would be the exact fact. The telescope, the whirling walls of Piper Wally, the singly curious regular rhythm, white, unlike that of the vert, visible ritual. So only the sunshine seemed to lessen about the intervention of any discernible crowd. It was a very peculiar phenomenon, a plainly marked by all. Grumbling sounds seemed brew, brewing beneath the hills, big strange with concordant rumbling, which clearly came from the sky. Lightning flashed aloft, the wandering crowd looked in vain for the potents of the storm. The chanting of the men from Markham now became unspeakable, and we just saw through the glass, they were all, all raising their arms in rhythmic incarnation. From some farmers far away came the frantic barking of the dogs. The dogs. Change in the quality of daylight increased. The crowd gazed but a rising in wonder, a purplish darkness born of nothing more than a spectacle for the arctic breathing. The sky is blue, pressed down upon the rumbling hills. The lightning flashed again, somewhat brighter than before. The crowd fancied it shone a certain mistiness around the altar stone on a distant height. No one had ever been using this telescope at that instant. Were wheels? Continued the regular pulsation. pulsation. Men have done which brace themselves tensely, yet some implorable menace in which the atmosphere seems subcharged. Without warning came those deep, crackled, roaches and vocal sounds, which will never leave the memory of the second group who heard them. Second group, group who heard them. Not for many whom in throat were they born. From the organs of man can yield no such acoustic perversions. Rather, one would have said they came from the pit itself. Not their souls been so, had they not their souls been so unstately altar stone on the peak. It's almost erroneous to call them sounds at all. There's so much of their ghastly infrabase tone bay spoke to the dim seats of consciousness, a terror far subtler than the ear. Yet one must do so nice. Their form was instinctively, though vaguely, that of a half articulate words. They were loud, loud as the rumblings and thunder above which they echoed. Yet did they come from no, no visible being? A ghost of imagination might suggest conjectural resource, while the non visible beings huddled crowd in the mountains, base huddled all closer, and winced as if in expectation of a blow. Yahakaha, Yahakaha, Tisa Totaka Kaha, Yok, Yokseref rang the hideous croaking out of space. Yokaha, Neklaha. The spiking impulse seemed to fall to the air. There's some frightful psychic power struggle going on. And he really strained his eye, a telescope, but saw only three to crystally the shadowed human figures on the peak, all moving their arms firstly. In strange dresses as the incarnation drew nearer in, com- in culmination. From that black well, that what black wells of uh, cherubic fear or feeling, that what from what um, plumbed gulfs of extra cosmic consciousness, obscure, long lamented her territory, were his half articulate thunder croaking drawn. Presently they began to gather renewed force and coherence. They grew in stark, utter, intimate frenzy. Yaraha, Yaraha, Niara, Niara, Ahara, Ahara. Help, help, Hifa, Hifa, Father, Father, Yok, Serberhof. That was all. A padded group in the road, still really. And the indestructible English syllables that had poured thickly and thunderously down from the frantic vacancy beside that shocking altar stone, but never to hear such syllables again. Instead, they jumped violently, a terrific report which seemed to rend these hills, a deafening cataclysmic appeal whose source to be in earth a sky no hearer was able to. To place a single lightning bolt shot in the purple zenith, the order stone, a great tidal wave of viewless fouls, a scribal stench swept down from the hill to all the countryside, 
trees, grass, and the brush. The whip whipped into a fury, the frightened crowd at the mountain's base, weakened by the lethal factor that seemed to have to investigate them, but almost hurled off their feet. Dogs howled from the distance. Green grass and foliage wilted to the curious, sickly green, grey of a field, and forests were scattered the bodies of dead wilderness walls. Bills, the stench left quickly, but the vegetation never came right again. To this day, there is something queer and holy about the growths on and around the fearsome hill. Curiously, was only just regaining consciousness when the welcome of men came slowly down the mountain in beams of sunlight once more brilliant and untainted. They were grave and quiet, and seemed shaken by memories and reflections, even more terrible than those which had been reduced the group of natives to a state of carol carried quivering. In reply to jumbled questions, they only shook their heads and reformulated one vital fact. The thing has gone forever, Armitage said. It has been split up into what it was originally made of and can never exist again. It, is an, it was an impossibility in the normal world. Only the last faction was really the matter. Really matter in any sense we know. Like it was like its father. Most of it had gone back to him, some vague realm of dimension, outside our material universe, some vague abyss out of which only the most accursed rites of human blasphemy would ever have called him for a moment on the hills. There was a brief silence in that the pools of scattered senses. Poor Curtis Whitley began to knit back into sort of continuity, so he put his hands to his head with a moan. Memory seemed to pick itself up before he left off. A horrible sight prostrated him, burst him upon him again. Oh my God, that half face, that half face on top of it, that face with the red eyes, uncrinkly and being aware. Oh no chin like the Whitley's. It was an octopus, centipede, spider kind of thing. But it was a half shape of man's face on top of it. He looked like he was at Watley's, only it was yards and yards across the street. He paused, exhausted, as a whole group of natives stared in bewilderment, not quite crystallising fresh terror. Only old Zebulon Watley, who wonderingly remembered ancient things, but who had been silently for spoken aloud. Fifteen years gone, he remembered, he heard old Watley say, he heard Sunday, he heard a child of liberty calling his father name, a top of Santa Will. And George Osborne interrupted him, questioned the other man and you. What was it? Was it? What was it? And now the owl. And any owl ever did young, what was it? What did he call it about? The only here it came from. Auntie chose his words carefully. It was, well, it's mostly a kind of force. that doesn't belong in our pot space. A kind of force that acts and grows and shapes so by other laws and those of our sort of nature. We have no business calling in such things outside and only very wicked people, very wicked cops ever tried to. There was some of it in Wilbury, Wilbur Watley himself, enough to make a devil precocious runs on him, and to make his passing out a pretty out a pretty terrible sight. I'm going to burn his accursed diary. If you men are wise you'd you don't make that altar stone up there and pull down all the rings, same stones on other hills. Things that, that brought down the beings where were, those Watleys were to fond, so fond of. The beings are going to be let in the tangibility, wipe out the whole human race, drag the earth off to some nameless place for some nameless purpose. But as this thing, as to this thing, we have just sent back. What leads to raise it from a terrible part in doings that were, that were to come? Great grew fast and big for the same reason that what will Wilbur grew fast and big. It beat him because it was greatest share, outlessness, sideness in it. It never did need the arsenal. How Wilbur Reese called it out the air, didn't call it, he didn't call it out. It was his twin brother, but it looked, like, looked more like the father than he did. Thank <laughs> you.